All right, listeners, I think you know that we are part of the Radiotopia Network, which is basically a network built on the idea that you should support the most creative, independent audio makers around. No one, and I mean no one, embodies the Radiotopia ethos more than Benjamin Walker and his show, Theory of Everything. Benjamin, who I've known for a long time, has been making beautiful, personal, sprawling audio documentaries for decades that help us understand the very strange world we live in. And now he has a new series called Not All Propaganda is Art. The new series goes back to the 1950s, when Western security agencies like the CIA paid artists, writers, and intellectuals to fight the cultural Cold War. The CIA funds were free. I mean, no one was told what to say. Gloria Steinem, activist who sees the CIA as a sort of enlightened pal or rich uncle, there is another viewpoint. Look, if you're listening to this show, I know you like secret histories. I know you like a mix of culture and politics and shadowy figures. So what are you waiting for? Not all propaganda is art from Benjamin Walker. You can find it now wherever you listen or at theoryofeverythingpodcast.com. This episode is brought to you by Progressive, where drivers who save by switching save nearly $750 on average. Quote now at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, national average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, February 3rd, 1986, the Hormel Meatpacking Plant in Austin, Minnesota is back open after about six months. Workers at the plant had been on strike against the Hormel Corporation, citing low wages, dangerous working conditions on the meatpacking line, and more. And now, the parent company, Hormel, was reopening the plant and bringing in a lot of new workers, many of them migrant workers. And this strike and this labor battle would continue for another six months or so, but this moment in early 86 was in many ways the moment the strike started to flounder and a real turning point in this labor story. The Hormel strike is considered a real critical one in American labor history, particularly in the 1980s. We've talked about it on this show, a case study for how labor and the power of unions was really changing throughout the 1980s. It is also a case study in another force in American cultural and political life, Spam, which is the canned cooked pork product. It is made by Hormel Foods. It became popular during World War II and persisted in the public imagination and the public stomachs ever since. Spam is what they were making at the Hormel plant in Austin, Minnesota. And Spam is the subject of a new multi-part series from the excellent podcast, The Experiment, which is co-produced by WNYC and The Atlantic and is hosted by Julia Longoria. She's the host of The Experiment. You may know her from More Perfect and uh, Radiolab and New York Times and podcasting royalty. Julia Longoria is here, <laughs> the host of The Experiment, to talk about spam. Julia, thank you for, for doing this. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> and with us, of course, is always Nicole Hammer of Columbia and Kelly Carter-Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. So in my head, I was like, oh, this series that they're doing at The Experiment is called How Spam Explains America. Um, but actually, I think your tagline, which is really good, is How the American Dream Got Canned. Excellent, excellent work on that. <laughs> excellent. Um, <laughs> but for listeners who, who may not know, the unlucky few who may not know, uh, what is Spam? Remind us kind of a little bit of its backstory, and then we'll work our way, as your series does, to this really interesting strike in, in 86 in Minnesota. Definitely. So Spam is... Uh, canned meat product. It was born uh, during the Great Depression. And basically, you know, the economy was struggling, families needed cheap food, and workers were being laid off. So uh, the Hormel company that makes Spam got creative and made a new product that would bring in more revenue and uh, create more jobs by creating something out of the pig parts that they didn't use before, that they throw throw away. Um, and they called it spiced ham or spam. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's how spam was born. The faces that Kelly and Nikki are making, by the way, is just <laughs> it's, it's Look, no you longer had that. Me at meat product. <laughs> I know. I was like, meat product. Oh, anytime you put product after meat, mm-hmm. <laughs> not even a specific meat, just 
meat product. Meat well, is spelled M-E-E-T because you don't want to get sued because it's not actually mm-hmm. meat. <laughs> um, I was I was Googling last night and looking around, and actually the official tagline, as far as I can tell, on the spam website, they refer to themselves as, quote, versatile canned meat. So, I mean, like, if that's what your ad agency comes up with, uh, it, it tells you something. Uh, look, spam as I think your series explores, you know, is the butt of a lot of jokes. Um, probably there's butts in the product itself. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it also, I think, like, is a real force and I think filled a real need um, for cheap food. And, you know, so I think it's, like, this interesting... I mean, where did you come down on that kind of idea of, like, spam as a as a joke and the butt of jokes and spam as maybe something that, like, people look down upon and has all sort of interesting dynamics on that front. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the whole series was actually born on the experiment from experiment producer Gabrielle Burpe, who actually, like, for her, spam was this glorious thing in her life that represented family, represented love, because she's Filipino-American. Mm-hmm. And after spam was invented or created or whatever you want to call it in, in the Great Depression, uh, it traveled around the world in the food rations of American GIs who landed in the Philippines um, when the Japanese troops invaded there. And spam, you know, came to represent for people in the Philippines like Gabrielle's grandfather, freedom and democracy yeah. and like kind of inspired, at least in the case of Gabrielle's grandfather, uh, inspired him to move to the U.S. Um, so we actually in our reporting, encountered a spam poet in Hawaii, Mm -hmm. like who talks about how spam is this food that becomes this sort of vessel for people's like hopes and dreams. (laughs) But also there, you know, in the case of American GIs, spam represented this violent time in their lives where they left home and like encountered all of this violence and and sadness. So spam came to represent something really dark for them too. So I, mm. it just, the more we kind of dove into the story, the more we realized that spam is this sort of like Rorschach's test mm-hmm. for <laughs> for America in a way. And, and people just put all these meanings and memories onto it. So I don't know where I land. I don't know, as far as your question, I don't know where I personally land. Yeah. To me, like spam, I don't. I had never really eaten spam before, honestly. Before this, this was uh, really Gabrielle's baby, um, and and I just realized, like, wow, s- spam has kind of been the almost like the uh, Forrest Gump of American history. It's like been there. <laughs> I'm here for that remake. <laughs> I know. Much cheaper. You don't have to pay Tom Hanks. That's you right. Have a little can of spam. Its way it's everywhere. <laughs> At every pivotal moment. (laughs) Nikki Kelly, do either of you kind of have a relationship with this product? I've never had spam before. Interesting. So my um, experience with it actually is that Hawaiian angle. The the first time I really encountered spam in the wild was through Spam Musubi, which is um, a a local product in uh, Hawaii, which is... uh, a bed of rice and then a slice of spam and then it's wrapped in nori and they would sell it at um, gas stations and it's just like this easy pick up and go kind of snack that they have around. Okay, take us to the mid 80s to Austin, Minnesota. Um, I and mean, one of the things you paint an incredible picture of in the series is the town of Austin really is sustained and built around the Hormel plant going all the way back what into the into the 30s. I mean, it is a company town in at least for the first few decades in really all the best ways. Yeah, and I, and I should say the way we kind of stumbled upon the strike history was um, Gabrielle in reporting why she, she her initial question was like, why is this a thing in the Philippines? And any historian she talked to was like, well, you can't talk about spam without talking about the strike. Right. Like, and we were like, what strike? So, so we sort of backed into this history that way. And Hormel was founded in 1891. George Hormel kind of arrived in Austin, Minnesota, traveling through. He was a businessman and he fell in love with the town, the story goes, and wanted to make a company that would, you know, as the museum says, like, take care of the families of Austin, Minnesota. So this was really a family company, um, you know, a la Hershey or, you know, this was a a town that kind of grew up around this company. Um, And for years, you know, generations of Austonians 
from Austin, Minnesota, not Austin, Texas, <laughs> uh, would work for the company. Uh, we talked to many people whose you know parents, grandparents, great grandparents worked at the company, um, and they talked about how it really sustained a way of life. You could make the equivalent if you worked your way up in the factory as a laborer. You could make the equivalent of a six-figure salary and take care of your family, go on multiple vacations, um, and really, you know, this town. We we got a tour uh, from one of the sons of a of a striker a guy named Race Hardy, and he showed us the way that, like, the president of the company would live, like, three doors down from yeah. the from laborers. You know, this was really a place where it seemed like, you know, class differences really blurred yeah. in a way that we feels very foreign today. Um, and so, you know, in the 80s, as you've covered in the show before, there was economic turmoil that the, the economy was doing poorly and there was this pressure to keep up with forces of globalization there was stagflation going on and so companies around the country began to lower wages began to lay off workers and Hormel was not immune from those forces and so they lowered wages for the first time in the company's history i mean wages had been constant or rising since the very beginning and they cut wages by 20%. And so wow. that really shook the town. Um, mm-hmm. And so strikers came to the company and said, look, let's, you know, let's come up with a deal. Let's keep our wages constant, not, you know, not raise them, but keep them constant. And the company said, no, we really can't, these forces of globalization. And so ultimately they decided to go on strike. What was so, I think, fascinating to me about this is that we've talked about strikes before but the fact that like you know the the president or the ceo doesn't live off in la or new york city or isn't you know but is right there in the town and they're all attending church together and they're all doing carpool for their kids school and there's such a not just a familiarity, but like a friendship that's embedded within the corporation that you can't sort of separate out the person and the president and the labor. And it's like, these are real people who have real connections, which makes this strike so not just political, but personal Mm -hmm. in terms of how it plays out. The, the podcast just does such a great job of, of highlighting that. Yeah, that's, you know, it's really like the thesis of the show of the experiment is like that these huge political, um, governmental, economic forces play out in these really small microcosms. (laughs) And this town really was that, you know, like Race Hardy, who's the son of a striker who we talked to, who's also an economics professor, talked about how like all these strikes were happening around the country. It felt like there was this wave of strikes failing and Mm -hmm. it all came to a head And it didn't come to a head in like, you know, Philadelphia or like some urban center. It came to the head in this tiny town where, you know, you in other places you didn't have. He says you didn't have to worry about someone spitting on the back of your head at church. But here you did. And because it was personal, the strikers thought maybe here we could turn the tide because you can't Mm -hmm. hide from, you know, the effects of Mm -hmm. lowering wages of of doing these things that, that were happening around the country. It's also so notable that that pain that you're talking about and that friction still continues to this day. Like the people who Mm. were involved in the strike, particularly the strikers versus the scabs who crossed the picket line, it seems like those hurt feelings and that sense of betrayal is still pretty alive, you know, all this time later. Very, very much so, to the point where, you know, we started making calls and people really, to this day, did not want to talk about this strike. We talked to uh, one brother who became sort of a face of the strike in the news because his brother crossed the picket line and he said, any scab is no brother of mine. And, Mm -hmm. you know, in the moment he was standing up for what he believed in, but you know, any thought that he would be vindicated because he thought that they would ultimately prevail and he would keep his benefits. And But ultimately, he lost his job and he lost his brother. And so for years after that, you know, like the grandparents had to ha- hold separate Christmases for the two uncles wow. and their kids. Like it just th- this really ran so deep. 
And many of those wounds have been healed, but it feels like this thing that they don't want to, they don't want to slip back into that place mm-hmm. where the town was so deeply torn apart. I and mean, that's one of the ways in which this story feels so resonant for, for now is a moment where, you know, we're not just having large political, contentious political conversations at a sort of national level, but it is starting to get down to that level where it is driving deep and tearing people apart and tearing communities apart. And that's sort of, in many ways, the most heartbreaking part of this era that we're living in now and those, you know, those real interpersonal wounds. And and there's lots of other parallels, which I want to circle back to, but let's go through the TikTok of the strike itself. Um, so, you know, we mentioned this moment here in early 1986, where Workers get brought in after six months of the plant closure. How significant of a move is that by Hormel, particularly bringing in migrant workers to fill these these positions? It was, I mean, you, you have to think about the fact that this is Austin, Minnesota, where I, you know, I went to Austin, Minnesota in November, and it was like 15 degrees already in November. And so, like, Winter comes in the strike. The strikers began in August in the summer, and they're standing outside of the Hormel meatpacking plant with signs. Every day they're going to picket saying, like, cram your spam. <laughs> and, and, you know, like, <laughs> we're, you know, fighting for this cause. But then winter hits, and they're out there. Those guys mm-hmm. out there, they're not able to get their kids Christmas presents. They're not able, you know, they're going on to food lines to get, you know, powdered milk for their families. And then, you know, in January of 1986, after they've already been on strike for months and it's freezing outside and their families are like, what are you doing? Then Hormel hires people to, from outside to come in and take those jobs. And so morale really began to flounder. That was really a turning point. Um, and, you know, as one person we talked to told us, you know, it went from like people were angry to People were desperate, you know, yeah. and the, and it got violent in some cases. The members of corporate and their families had to go to the grocery store with bodyguards. It, it was just it got ugly. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that was also hard was just like these are not easy choices that people are making when they choose to strike or when they choose to go back to work, and so. You know, hearing about some of the workers who are like, hey, my wife got diagnosed with cancer or, hey, you know, I need my health benefits and like having to choose between, you know, breaking the strike line and not just taking care of your family, but like, you know, taking care of your your physical health made it almost impossible for people to say no or for people to not persist in, in the strike. Right. I mean, I don't think they knew they were signing up for being on strike for over a year. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, and you know, we talked to some people who, you know, their daughter had epilepsy or wives who got cancer. And we talked to one, you know, one of the strike leaders who actually encouraged people at a certain point, like, this is it. You got to cross. You got to do what's right for your family. Um, and, and other leaders, you know, felt differently, felt like, you know, if you crossed... Even, you know, in the winter after a year of being on strike, like, you have to stand up for what you believe in. So we had, even today, there's disagreement over, you know, what the right call was. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. And just just to put a finer point on that, I mean, there is a, you know, an argument to be made that it was really the national union in many ways that did not have these workers back. And in many ways, the union... Seemingly was kind of negotiating directly with the company and maybe even siding with the company on some map. But, you know, I think there's there's certainly if you think about the story and the history of labor negotiations in this country, I think a lot of people look at this as a moment where national unions sold out their local chapters. Um, How much did you come to see that or how much did you think of this as more a traditional kind of workers versus management story? Oh, definitely. I mean, we really focused in on what was happening on the ground in Austin in, in our story and less on sort of the national the international union, but certainly it seemed like, you know, this was a moment when the international union said, look, these are forces, these are economic forces that are affecting everyone and you're not going to be able to turn back this tide. So we're, you know, we're abandoning you basically. Like if you're not able to, you you need to accept this deal that Hormel is offering you because the the Hormel did offer them a deal at some point um, that still lowered their wages, but less than they originally offered. Um, And the international union was like, 
get on board. Let's go. Like this is this is the way the country's going and we don't have any power to change it. And you can watch actually the I don't know if you've seen the documentary American Dream by Barbara Koppel. Yeah. She uh, was on the ground during that time. And the picture that that documentary paints is really one of, you know, like the local union, the the David to the Goliath really like it, it, it paints a picture of them as almost being foolish, you know, as like, mm. um, like you got to just get on board. This is the way it is. And we really wanted to tell us st- the story of what exactly that local union was trying to do. And they did inspire a lot of hope around the country and internationally. Um, so that, that, that is true. But ultimately, I think it was they lost. There's no way around it. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. You can understand, though, how in the face of all of those pressures, it was so difficult to sign that new contract because it wasn't just your wages being lowered. It was giving up on a promise that you had been made since Mm -hmm. you were born, that this is the way the United States works, that you work hard, you get a better life, things will be better for your children. And this is that moment when it becomes crystal clear that it's not just going up. like Now it's going down. And you're doing all of these things that you've been taught to stand up against that and they're not working and that's a there's real no loyalty psych- too yeah it's such a psychological blow mm. yeah totally and and i think you know what they really this little town in the middle of minnesota inspired this kind of movement around the country which i i hadn't realized before looking into this history that um, it had such a reach nationally, I think, because the air traffic controller strike that that Reagan broke was in 1981. Yep. This was in 1985. So around the country, so many strikes had failed. And this mm-hmm. was, you know, Austin was a, was one where maybe they'd win, like maybe they'd turn back the tide. And so, mm-hmm. you know, we heard stories that are impossible to fact check, but we heard stories that... Um, a minister from South Africa came to Austin, Minnesota, and <laughs> actually ended up smuggling a "Cram Your Spam" T-shirt into ne- Nelson Mandela's jail cell. <laughs> There's, like, There's this, zero like, reason to fact check that story. Yeah, exactly. Just live with it. Ah, as yep. it is. Yeah. It's now canon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> canon. Huh? Uh. So, um, yeah, it's just this larger than life, almost like it reminds me kind of like a big fish, you know, this story mm-hmm. of spam yeah, kind yeah. of like this, yeah, this mythological yeah. Uh, scope mm. that it had. <laughs> so I think that if there was any reason to hope, though, that it might succeed, Austin was kind of that place because it represented not just the small town, but th- the friendships that were embedded within the workplace that... I don't know, inspired people to think that the loyalty might be held onto with a much tighter grip than other places. But we see as as time goes on, not only does that loyalty sort of like dissipate, but that more and more people who are coming into these factories to work are, are not friends. They're mostly foreigners. They're mostly migrant workers that are coming in and being paid cheap labor and then um, or cheap wages, I should say. And then you also have like the working conditions are also, you know, rapidly decreasing as well. These are not safe places to work. I don't know. Could you speak to like how the labor force has changed over time and what the meat market looks like now? Yeah. And, you know, in in Austin, as an example, after, you know, the company hired replacement workers for the strikers, 1,500 went on strike, 500 (laughs) Uh, crossed the picket line. So there were quite a few jobs that needed to be filled. And so the years passed and eventually those replacement workers who were people who came from, you know, nearby towns in Minnesota began to be replaced by immigrant labor. Um, So Minnesota right now is a third Latino. And I think that that is really a trend in the meatpacking industry in general. A lot of immigrant labor came in to fill these jobs that used to be jobs that paid much better. Um, And so now um, there, you know, the way we kind of talked about it was like the American dream didn't die. It just kind of um, went to a different group of people (laughs) who were coming from a lower circumstance. And Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I mean, now with the pandemic, we've heard a lot of reports of like, you know, immigrant laborers who were working in these conditions and getting COVID. And so it's really as union power died, 
it, it created a unsafe situation for these immigrant laborers who came in who were more vulnerable to um, and, and, and have less recourse um, now to fight back. And that's really actually what we get at, at in episode three of the series called El Sueño de Spam <laughs> um, about sort of who were the workers who came in? What is the legacy of this strike that mm. lost? And um, yeah, not the happiest story. <laughs> mm. I mean, the Hormel plant in the spring of 2020 was hit with a COVID outbreak, you know, a couple hundred cases, um, about 10 percent of the cases in Minnesota at the time were within these meatpacking plants. And, you know, we talk about kind of a responsibility to to workers. One, you know, obviously, there's the building a, a sustainable life, but you know, health and safety is the number one. And we see that that those pressures come crashing down in recent years as well. Um, is there still how do I put it? Is there still spam pride in in a sense um in a town like austin or just in general I and mean, what is spam sort of place in 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 our public imagination as it were yeah i mean i guess in within spam town usa i would say while it's easy to kind of look at the the situation in the meatpacking industry and be like you know wages are lower we're, we're seeing these kinds of unsafe working conditions we really found that the population, the like Latino, the immigrant community there is really like vibrant and talks about um, spam and about working at the factory in similar ways to the way that strikers talked about working there before the 80s. You know, it's this difficult job, but we're able to, you know, have benefits. We're able to take care of our families. And so it was not like a, I don't know, there is still this like persistent love of spam there um (laughs) it's really it's really striking um and the spam museum is alive and well and we went you know there's people from all over the world (laughs) who are visiting the spam museum um from from the philippines from hawaii from japan from korea we we saw tourists from all Mm -hmm. over the world coming to austin minnesota um and then it's interesting across from the spam museum there's a Latin dance club now, which I'm sure was not the case in yeah. the 80s. Um, so it's just, it's fascinating to see the way that Austin, Minnesota really is a microcosm of the country. Oh my um, gosh. So we're not going to Disney World, we're going to Austin, Minnesota. <laughs> That's right. This day road trip. <laughs> um, well, I'm sure you will, and maybe we will as well, hear from, you know, spam aficionados and people who have family connections and recipes and so forth. So that'll, that'll be great. And the series is starting to roll out now three-part series you can find it on the experiment wonderful podcast from wnyc and the atlantic julia langoria is the host thank you so much for doing this let's do more let's i'm sure you have lots of other fascinating stories coming up so we should have you on again sometime soon but thank you for doing this thank you thanks for having me and i love that uh nicole hammer thanks to you thank you jody and kelly carter jackson thanks to you my pleasure Locks found on the gates of the Hormel corporate office were the first indication there would be trouble. The demonstration was peaceful at first, but turned ugly when protesters surrounded police as they began making arrests. We want a contract! We want a contract! Support for this day in esoteric political history comes from Odoo. What is Odoo? Well, Odoo is an all-in-one management software with apps for every business need. Odoo has apps for CRM, accounting, sales, HR, inventory, manufacturing, and everything in between. And they're all in one easy-to-use software. And the best part about Odoo? All Odoo apps are integrated, helping you get things done faster and more efficiently. So when you think about business, think Odoo. To learn more, visit odoo.com slash this day. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash this day. Radiotopia. Radiotopia.